Where is God amidst pain, suffering, and tragedy? This is a huge question, whether a believer in God or not, that we all wrestle with. There's typical answers that pastors and apologists will give, but there's a certain angle to this that's often missed within the church and without. And my guest today has written a new book that's just fascinating and kind of opens up a new way of approaching this topic. His book is called Eyes to See, and it's focused on what is called common grace, which we're going to get into. My guest, Dr. Tim Muehlhoff, we have been friends for a couple decades plus, yeah, at least. Yeah. Colleague of mine at Biola University. Uh, thanks for coming back on the show. Man, love it, Sean. We have known each other. I think I had hair when we first met. I'm pretty, <laughs> I'm pretty sure I had hair. <laughs> well, I will choose not to comment on that. I remember it differently. <laughs> but... Uh... <laughs> Well, let's let's jump in because obviously this topic is a real sensitive one. And you write a book on suffering, pain, tragedy, and towards the beginning, you tell a story about your wife and indicate that this is not just academic to you. Would you mind sharing what you went through as writing this book? Yeah, uh, my wife had a, a simple procedure and the doctor just happened to notice something that didn't seem right, so he biopsied it. And sure enough, it came back that it was cancerous. And then I'm sure a lot of your listeners who have traveled on this journey know, now you go and take the exam that's gonna be a full body exam that is gonna see if the cancer has metastasized. So you can imagine how nervous we were sitting in the lobby of St. Jude Hospital, and we're gonna go three floors down to, to, you know, to, to a technician who's probably not seen the light of day, you know, for months, and he's going to take a full scan and we're going to know if we have a serious problem or if, or if it's just localized. So, Sean, I remember sitting there uh, next to her. We weren't talking much and I, I just took her hand and I said something that just struck me. Thank God for this machine hmm. that we're going to know what we're dealing with with certainty and Noreen smiled and said, yeah, that's, yeah, absolutely. Thank God for that lab tech, the machine, this hospital. And Sean, it occurred to me, I don't often do that. I, I take things for granted a lot. Mm -hmm. And did we pray that God would supernaturally take away the cancer? Yeah, he didn't do it that way. Mm -hmm. So sure enough, it came back. This is not metastasized. It's localized. There happened to be a guy in Southern California. This was his specialty. And he went in, took it out, and she is now wow. cancer-free. And I praise God for that lab tech, that surgeon, a, a doctor who just happened to see something and biopsy it. And for me, could that all be pure chance? Hmm. Uh, yeah, maybe. But Or it could be God directing, not just the doctor who saw it, but also guided the people who came up with the machine that uh, did a full body scan and a gifted surgeon, by the way, non-Christian surgeon, he's mm. not a believer, and he is the one who did a great job and now my wife is cancer free. Well, I'm thrilled to hear that she's doing better. And I wanted you to share that so people know as we get into this topic, it's not just academic. You're a professor. It is academic, but it's personal for you. Oh, yeah. You've been through this in other ways we won't even go into. But you're raising interesting questions. Is it okay to thank God and the scientist? I think there's some people who are like, leave God out of it. We've got the scientist. Why even bother right. to thank God? Well, we're going right. to get into some of those questions. But tell me just for starters to kind of frame this for us. What question was at the heart of what you were asking when writing your book, Eyes to See? So uh, I first started to think about this long before my wife's cancer, Sean. I've been a migraine sufferer for almost um, 18 years. Now, just let me give you a reason why that might be the case. I'm also a Detroit sports fan, Sean. <laughs> so I, I actually care about the Detroit Lions who won <laughs> two games this season. Um, but I've had migraines for 18 years, and I have honestly prayed that God would deliver me from these migraines, uh, and he hasn't, I, I still get them. And, and to make matters worse, I actually have a friend who prayed that he'd be delivered from migraines. And guess what? He got delivered. Hmm. He does not have migraines now. I do have migraines. So the question becomes, if God doesn't supernaturally take away my migraines, is he asleep at the wheel? 
Interesting. Uh, is, God, is God not doing anything about my migraines? And Sean, I just had one yesterday. I had to take migraine medication. It worked. So I can either become angry, mm. God, why don't you heal me like you did that other person? Or I can just like I did with that machine that did a full body scan of my wife, I can say, thank God for a talented neurologist. Uh, thank God for migraine medication that within an hour took away the migraine. Uh, see, I, I can either be disappointed, like, God, come on, really? I, I got to take migraine medication again? So I think expectations, and you know this being married, expectations determine if you're happy or not. Like, what's my expectation of my wife? What's my expectation of my kids, my boss? And if they don't meet the expectations, then my happiness really plummets. Well, we, you better believe we have expectations of God. And the question becomes, are they only expectations that God would act in overtly supernatural ways? Or do I recognize his hand in the very subtle things, everything from uh, being able to do something like this during a pandemic and, and migraine medication? Or am I expecting God to act in an overt way that I would say, oh, man, that is the Lord. And I would just bow down and worship. What you said about expectations is so interesting because this shapes how we process the evil and suffering that we go through. Mm. I was preaching on Matthew 26 recently about answers to prayer and talking about how P Paul prayed that God would take this thorn of the flesh away mm. and he didn't. Jesus yeah. prays, take this cup away from me and it doesn't. So if God doesn't answer at least one prayer for each of them, maybe yeah. that should shape our expectations. That's a little bit of what... We're going to get into here. By the way, I see some great comments already from people and oh, questions. Good. As we yeah. get to the end, we're going to take some questions. So write stuff down. Don't forget it. And at the end, I'll have you write in caps question, and we will give your questions to Dr. Muehlhoff. So yeah. in this book, you talk about what's called common grace. Mm -hmm. Define that for us and maybe explain how it's just different from grace. Oh, good. So James makes an interesting comment. He says, every good thing comes from God. It comes down from the Father of lights. Well, many commentators believe that James is literally looking up at the starry sky and seeing a plethora of stars and saying, just as there are that many stars in the sky, that's as many good gifts as God has given to the planet. So God, because of his foreknowledge, understands where this human rebellion is going to go. He understands it's going to result in war. There's going to be sickness. There's going to be environmental issues. And he either can just wipe his hands of us and say, hey, you wanted a world in rebellion? You wanted to run the world? Take it. It's yours, right? But he doesn't do that. He says, no, no, no. I know wars are going to happen, so mm -hmm. I'm going to try to mitigate um, the effects of war. I know sickness is going to happen, so I'm going to give you something called penicillin. I mean, Sean, if we didn't have penicillin, we'd be in the dark ages. So the question becomes, do we recognize the common grace, which, and, and by the way, the word we, the reason we use common, it, it's to believers and unbelievers, right? The okay. rain falls on the just and the unjust. Okay. Penicillin was actually created by a non-Christian lab tech. So he gives these common graces, these good gifts to everybody, and you can either use it or misuse it. For example, you know, dynamite, which I would say is a common grace, was originally hmm. created uh, to be used for agriculture. But you better believe the military took that and said, oh my <laughs> gosh, dynamite. And it became one of the most effective killing mechanisms that we've ever had on planet mm. Earth. Originally created to help, you know, in tough soil to break things up. But every good gift God can give can be used for good or for bad. Um, and so I think every good thing we experience, if what James is saying is true, really does come down from God. Okay, so let's connect some dots. And this, as I was reading through your book, instantly a thought went through my mind is, okay, from a Christian perspective, I can understand what's meant by common grace. Whether it's a human invention such as dynamite, uh, maybe it's rain, maybe it's scientific discovery. We're going to get into some of those particulars. But how would this help answer the question of God's seeming absence in hardship, evil, and suffering? Well, Sean, first off, I think we just need to recognize what Pascal said. 
Pascal said every religion, including Christianity, has to wrestle with the seeming hiddenness of God. Mm. And I think everybody wrestles with that. C.S. Lewis wrestled with it. After the death of his wife, um, he wrote a grief observed where he said, you know, I need God the most. And I knock on the door. I get no response. I even hear a locking and a double bolting on the inside. And I think as Christians, we just sit back and say, listen, all of us are struggling with the pandemic. All of us are struggling with wanting God to do more. I, I, I was sharing, when I was writing this book, I was sharing it with some non-Christian friends of mine. And one of them reminded me of a Woody Allen quote that I actually <laughs> had used in a book called The God Conversation I wrote with J.P. Moreland. Woody Allen said this, if God exists, he's got to be an underachiever. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, because yeah. we want we want and I think it's OK with my non-Christian friends and even Christian friends to say, man, read the Psalms. It's OK to say, God, where were you? And that's what I love about the scripture. It allows you to wrestle. So the very first thing I do in evangelistic situations or talking to Christians who are disappointed is to say, listen, it is OK to be disappointed. I wrestle. An 18-year migraine sufferer. Uh, so, Sean, one of the most powerful sermons I've ever given. Uh, so when I get a migraine, I have to be in a dark room. Everything bothers me. Light can't be on. Music can't be played. Wow. And I have to wait two hours before I can take the next migraine medication if the first one wow. didn't work. Well, I was literally preaching the next day. Sean, guess what passage I was preaching on? Uh, tell me. I, I could guess, but... James... Consider it pure joy when you encounter trials of many kind. So I literally mm. called my sermon that day, James on a migraine. <laughs> so I'm sitting in my room, and literally looking at the clock, Sean, with a pounding migraine, and I've got to wait two hours before I can take the next one. And I'm thinking about my sermon going, Lord, I could be so much more productive if I didn't have migraines. I could write more books. I could speak more. And then, you know, the Holy Spirit, Sean, is pretty funny when the Holy Spirit shows up, right? Because you kind of want to say to the Holy Spirit, like, I'm your project for today. You've got nothing else. Like, how's the second coming coming? You know what I mean? It's like, so um, I think the Holy Spirit honestly said to me, Sean, that's the problem. You think you, you need to be more productive. And God's telling you, can you sit back for a while? Can you do Sabbath rest? God mm. doesn't need you to be more productive. He needs you to rest in him. And I was like, oh, I did not like that answer. Uh, so, Sean, first thing I say to people is it's okay to want God to do more. Mm. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. But then let's at least give God enough credit to say, but I do think via common grace, there's a lot of things he's been doing. And guess what? Mm. That second max salt did work. So two hours later, I took the second one, and Sean, the feeling you have when the migraine goes away is unbelievable. Hmm. And so now I literally walk out of my room, say to my wife, thank God for Maxall. Hmm. And Noreen's like, <laughs> and that's kind of our joke now, thank God for Maxall. Because without it, I mean, I, I'd be in the fetal position. I, I don't know what I'd be doing without Maxall. So that's what I'm kind of saying, Sean, is, it's okay to question God. He, okay. he can handle it. He even encourages it in the Psalms. But let's at least allow his answer to be a complex, widespread answer of both common grace and dramatic answers to prayer. Remember my friend who did get healed yep. by somebody laying hands. And I've had, I've had people lay hands on me to be healed, and, and it just hasn't happened. Hmm. Uh, so I want to give God... At least let him have a broad answer that includes common grace, but is not just limited to common grace. So we're going to talk about what this means and whether it's evidence for the Christian faith or not. But again, I have to highlight the power of expectations. A moment ago, you mentioned C.S. Lewis. And we might think if you're C.S. Lewis, he would be spared from the death of his wife. I mean, look oh. at all he's given to the kingdom. That's an expectation and assumption that might not be how God sees things. Look at your life. God, make me better and I'd be more productive. Well, maybe God has bigger ideas than just our production that matter. 
that's a part of what you're pushing back on. Now, you have an example from the movie The Hunger Games to illustrate common grace. So talk about that just so we understand what you mean here. Okay, so I, I use The Hunger Games, which is a great book series as well as I think a really good adaptation with Jennifer Lawrence. Mm -hmm. um, so I only use one sliver of The Hunger Games, which okay. is one in the midst of so much violence, you know, these young children, uh, two per district, are, are, have to fight to the death. And the one person who survives is now exempt from the Hunger Games. It's being done to put different districts in their place, just to give context. So during the Hunger Games, uh, Jennifer Lawrence and uh, the person that she's paired with, he gets hurt right away. And he's hiding in a cave, and she's out trying to find food. And here comes a parachute with okay. healing balm. Now, what you need to know about the Hunger Games, people are actually watching it. It's broadcast everywhere. And you can actually, if you're a patron, you can pay to have AIDS come down in parachutes. Mm. So the only thing I say about the Hunger Games is, one, God is not oblivious to the violence. We live in a very violent world. But just like those parachutes come down, God is watching, saying, oh, you're going to need, guess what? In a world in which it's very violent for women, you're going to need self-defense. And, and it's interesting, Sean, how self-defense systems have cropped up all over the world and, and virtuous self-defense systems that believe uh, you're a virtuous protector of people. Karate, the originator of karate, you only use it defensively. It's never to be used offensively. So in the Hunger Games, I say, just like that, a parachute comes down. That's how James says these good gifts come okay. down from God. So it's a great conversation starter to say to okay. a person, have you seen the Hunger Games? Yeah, I've seen the Hunger Games. Well, you know that really scene with the parachute? That's how I think of God sending gifts to people in very desperate situations. Okay, so let me play the skeptic with you a little bit because if it's coming down to parachute, we know distinctively that humans have created parachutes. So it has the right. mark of some intelligence. But second, the people designing these Hunger Games are evil and they're abusers. So yeah. even an evil god allegedly could do this based upon your illustration. So how would you respond to that? Well, I would simply say every illustration has a limited okay. Um, application. Okay. So, yeah, I, I would say you're right. In the Hunger Games, there's evil people subjugating other people. And we know that God didn't cause the Hunger Games. God didn't cause sin. He doesn't want the world to be like it is. And we know Revelation 21, eventually he'll rectify things. Uh, there'll be no more pain, suffering, death. The first things have gone away. Um, so I only use it in, as a conversation starter to say, what did you think of the parachute when it came down? Uh, I tend to think of God like that, that he sends us these gifts. That's, that's my, I want to okay. find pop culture references Got that it. allow me to have spiritual conversations. Okay, that's fair. So yeah. in a minute, we're going to jump into some of the examples you get from science, from art, from war, communication. But before we do so, maybe just communicate for our audience your expectations with this are you trying to prove that god exists are you just trying to make people think are you trying to build up the faith with people i mean your book is called eyes to see so in some ways if you adopt certain glasses then you yeah. see things so somebody could say tim this is question begging if you start with faith you're going to end by interpreting things through that lens so what's the expectation for people watching whether christian or not well, I would say this is definitely pre-evangelistic, and I would okay. say it's pre-apologetic pre in that sense. So I did write a book with J.P. Moreland called The God Conversation, Great using book. stories and illustrations to explain your faith. This book kind of comes before it. This is the book that gets you to the apologetic conversation. It whets the appetite of a person to want to hear more. So I use the illustration early on. And again, I say this, you can't prove God by just appealing to common grace. But I say to people, what are the top 10 uh, ancient inventions that shaped how we do life? And it's kind of fun to have people um, think of what that would be. For sure, the wheel makes it. For okay. sure, tools make it. Uh, number one is fire. Usually fire is picked by experts. Sean, I read academic papers <laughs> on the creation of fire. And I'm like, 
God bless these people. <laughs> right? Huge articles. But here's what's interesting. These ancient inventions, like, like people will quibble experts about uh, maybe which uh, was more important, but they're all roughly happening at the same time, Sean. And there is no communication among civilizations. We're talking ancient uh, civilization. So um, everybody's roughly coming up with the idea of fire. Everybody's roughly coming up with the idea of tools, uh, the wheel, shoes, right? So I, I say in the book, um, now how did they get that? How did they all kind of get on the same page with the same inventions? Can you imagine an ancient Zoom call, Sean? <laughs> like the whole civilization's having a Zoom call and they're saying, hey, what did you come up with this week? Well, I came up with a shoe. A what? A shoe. I'll send you, I'll send you a picture. Uh, hey, we came up with fu- that was not happening. Hmm. So the question becomes, how did roughly these ancient civilizations, the idea for it, get disseminated? I'm arguing modestly that it is possible God, not the Christian God, but God, a higher uh, power, gave us these gifts. Now, if a person wants to say, well, then why are you sure it's Christianity and not Islam? or Buddhism, or Hinduism. I'm like, hey, great question. Would love to have that conversation. This really is a way to just pique people's interest to ask more questions that allows me to have these kind of conversations I want to have. Okay, so maybe for the believer, it's saying if you adopt the CNI, you'll recognize that God is more present than you might realize. Yeah. For the non-believer, you're saying, would you consider looking at this a different fashion? Yeah. That maybe this is an act of grace in a way you haven't considered, and if so, what might that suggest about the nature of the universe? Is that fair? Yes, and yes, and Sean, one of the great uh, ways to open spiritual conversations since writing this book, I actually stick it in the beginning. It's a joke. I know you know, and I bet you many of your listeners know, but it's great joke to start an apologetic conversation. Here's the joke. A a man gets word that there's a flash flood that is about to happen and he's to go to safety, but he's not worried because God's going to save him. So sure enough, the flood comes. He's now on the second floor of his house. The water is rising. A person comes by in a boat, says, hey, jump in the boat. We can save you. He goes, no, I'm good. God's going to save me. Now he's up on the roof and uh, a helicopter comes by and says, hey, here's a ladder. Get in a helicopter. He goes, no, I'm good. God's going to save me. Well, he drowns. He stands before God, and, he, and he's mad. He says, God, what the heck? And God goes, what do you want? I sent you a radio message, a boat, and a helicopter. <laughs> now, my friends will laugh, and I say, by the way, do you know the backstory of a helicopter? And, and my friends are like, my non-Christian friends are like, no. I go, it's Igor Sikorsky who as a 12 year old kept having a reoccurring dream about a floating boat that would come down, pick people up and take them straight up in the air. He wrote, he did drawings and then finally became an engineer, came to the United States. 1935 is credited with the first fully functioning helicopter in the United States. And I say to my friends, and by the way, do you know where Sikorsky believes the idea came from? And they'll say, what? God. He believes God gave him that dream as a 12-year-old. Now, my (laughs) friends will say, well, you, okay, but you can't prove that. I said, but but is it a possibility God gave him the dream? And my friends are like, well, sure. I said, by the way, I think there's so many examples, not just helicopters, but there's other examples where I think it's either chance or it's God, and I'd love to have that conversation. Mm. And I've had a lot of people bite on it, Sean. They're like, oh, all right, what more do you got than a helicopter? I'm like, okay, penicillin. Let's talk about penicillin. It's really fun to say we can go with chance, or is it possible it's divine inspiration, even non-Christians being inspired? And again, Sean, this is all pre-evangelistic to get people to want to have the God conversation. Okay. Well, there's probably a lot of non-Christians I can tell by the comments who are here. So let's talk about these issues, knowing Christians are watching, maybe want to use this as a tool, and non-Christians who are like, I don't know if I'm convinced. 
So again, you're not trying to solve the problem of evil and suffering. Mm-mm. You're suggesting that maybe there's a different way of looking at this that leads to considering the Christian worldview. I'm trying to state the expectations for folks. And again, I see some questions coming in, some great questions. We're going to work through some of your examples so we're on the same page, and then we will come at the end. We'll leave a good chunk of time to come to some of these questions and see how to tackle them. So you mentioned penicillin. Uh, Tell us the story behind penicillin and why you think it's an example of God's common grace. Yeah, so it's great. So Alexander Fleming is a messy lab tech, and he knows it, but he's just messy. So he goes off for a two-week vacation, doesn't clean his lab, comes back, and notices on Petri dishes, mold has grown on Mm. some Petri dishes, only half on others, and on none when it comes to other Petri dishes. He goes, okay, that's weird. What's keeping the mold? from growing on a petri dish Hmm. that clearly uh, it's growing but it didn't cover the whole dish so he writes an obscure article an academic article that gives the makings of penicillin and he's done with it he literally moves on well now jump all the way to world war ii and the british government is concerned that men are soldiers are dying of disease on the bloody battlefields of Europe. So they get one guy, a researcher, and they say, you, a medical researcher, you need to find something to save our soldiers. He's like, oh, okay. So he goes to the archives, comes across this paper by Fleming, and goes, oh my gosh, this is the ma- this is the makings of penicillin, and now it's being mass produced in Britain, mass produced in the United mm. States. Not just soldiers, but also um, civilians. And Fleming himself said, you know, I really didn't mean to change medical history. <laughs> just <laughs> Understatement sort of, of the year. <laughs> yes. So I'm reading a book on the history of, of medicine. Hmm. And the guy goes, it is probably the most important serendipitous moment in human medical history. So I love to say to my friends, okay. We have two choices. One, it's completely happenstance. It's serendipitous. Okay. Can I give you an alternative theory? And they're like, okay, what's your alternative theory? God gave Fleming the idea and to notice the Petri dishes and then an obscure British researcher to find the paper. Well, you can't prove that. You can't prove it. Yeah, okay, it's just an alternative theory. Now, it's predicated on God. So can I give you some reasons why I believe in God? Mm-hmm. They're like, okay, why do you believe in God? Now we're doing the argument from design. We're doing the cosmological argument. Uh, for me, the moral argument, it, to me, is one of the clearest expressions of why I believe okay. in God. So, Sean, it kind of it. It gets my foot into the door. And usually we're laughing. And it's like uh, we're doing Krav Maga. I do martial arts, and these, these are the people I'm sharing with, and we're laughing as we're doing stuff, saying, dude, that's whack. You can't say that's God. And I'm like, well, you're right, but can you say it's not? Hmm. Well, I can't definitively say it's not. Okay, then maybe it is. And they're like, okay. And then he hits me in the head with a roundhouse kick. You know what I mean? <laughs> so that, those are the kind of conversations I've been having using The Walking Dead to get in to use um, uh, art, man, art has a way of opening our minds to um, experience things in a way that we normally wouldn't even consider it. Okay. Uh, and that's, that's one of the cool things of art is it's subversive and it gets us to think about things. Well, let's, let's come to art in a second. I've got a question for you though. I wanna make sure that people are tracked with us. You're not saying penicillin proves God. What you're saying is there's two ways of looking at this. One way is chance, accident, totally serendipity. The other way is God has created a world. Yes, things have gone wrong because of sin, but has enabled scientific discovery to help mitigate this pain and suffering. An example of what we call common grace. Now, if we adopt this position you're saying, then let me play the, just be skeptical again, then if penicillin was invented, I don't know, middle of the 20th century or so, correct me if I'm wrong, does God hate everybody who lived before that? Because the history of the world is pain and suffering and a lack of scientific discovery. And Sean, at that point, I just give people your cell number. 
<laughs> I can say I have got a friend that you need to. But Sean, here's the beautiful moment. And to be serious, here's a beautiful moment. I have that question. Mm. That's not just their question. I'm like, yeah. you know what, guys? I I'll be honest with you. There are times, and I hope your listeners don't take this the wrong way. There are times I'm disappointed mm -hmm. in, in, in how I see God act or don't act. See, I don't, need, I don't need to hide that from people. If you read Pascal, in one of his notes, he says, I am in anguish knowing God could prove himself undefinitively through nature. He doesn't. Mm. And I, I am in agony because he could do it. And so I, Sean, I, I'm just kind of gotten to the stage in my Christian witness. I'm just honest with people. Like, hey, that, I, I get it. Why wait until the, the mass production of penicillin didn't happen until early 1940s? Mm. So you, you're right, Sean. That, that could have been really helpful. 1910, 1900s. So let me give my best answer for that one. Okay. okay. So in the book, I mention um, uh, Danzel Washington, who's one of our finest actors. For sure. He said, I don't think anybody ever accomplishes anything without a mentor. He mm -hmm. goes, the mentor doesn't do the work for you, but he kind of shows you the way. Now it's up to the actor to, to go there, but a mentor kind of gives you the gifts, the abilities and shows you the way. Uh, I think that's what God does. He, he's going to partner with us. He mm. doesn't just want to do it by himself. He wants to have human partners because I, I say to people, why even make human beings? Like, like, what was the purpose that God would make a human being? Some people say worship. And I, I'm like, Sean, come on, worship? Uh, seraphs are six winged angels who, so far as we know, their only purpose is to fly around the throne of mm. God saying, holy, holy, holy. I'm not going to out Sarah a Sarah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I've I heard your they're... voice too. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> so I think, can he take care of creation by himself? Absolutely, mm. God can do that. But he gives Adam and Eve the creation mandate. In the New Testament, does God care about the poor and, and the disenfranchised and the vulnerable? Absolutely. So what does James say? True religion in the sight of God is caring for orphans and widows. Now, here's the thing Augustine says. God is willing to let things go undone because he's using human partners. Mm. Right? C can I give an illustration, Sean? You have kids who play sports. I do. Okay? My kids played Pop Warner football. And they had a coach who said, you show up with your helmet and shoulder pads. And if you don't, we're doing wind sprints. If one person shows up without a helmet or a shoulder pads, so Sean, I'm driving them to practice. And how many times do you think I'm saying to these kids, guys, got your helmet, shoulder pads? Yeah, dad, we do. You don't, come on. One day, Sean, there's a helmet. It is sitting in the guest bathroom downstairs. <laughs> Sean, as I'm walking out the door, I say, guys, dad, enough. I literally called my wife and said, I'm going to enjoy this. <laughs> I am going to enjoy this. We get there. One of my kids, I will not name who they are, runs up to me. Dad, I don't have my helmet. Oh, well, okay. I guess we're doing wind sprints. Dad. And guess what? He called them out. He mm -hmm. said, hey, blank Milhoff, where's your helmet? Uh, I don't have it. Okay, everybody, wind sprints. Let's go. Wow. Right? I, I think God's like that, Sean. God's mm -hmm. like, listen, please, I've told you, make sure you pack your helmet and shoulder pads, but I'm not going to force you to do this. So I, I think God, I, I think if it weren't for human rebellion, uh, uh, sin, I, I think we'd live in a totally different world. And I think if we were more compliant with God, we would have gotten medical discoveries quicker. Mm. But, but we always push back on God saying, God, we got it. We don't need you. And we actually resent 
you butting in, we got this. And God's like, well, unfortunately, that's going to mean a whole lot of bad things. I'm not going to abandon you, but I am not forcing you to um, make this world in a place that people can flourish. I want that to happen, but I'm not forcing you to do it. Mm. You know, one of the hard things about this conversation is back to what you said about expectations, being disappointed with God. I think about in the scriptures, I mean, the Psalms, you mentioned early reading the Psalms, how much David, a man after God's own heart, cries out for God and he's absent and he's not present. Why? Well, the only way to answer that is to look at the Christian story and what God has made us for. It's not our comfort. It's not the American dream. It's to be in relationship with him and to form our character. As painful as that can be, if we see it through that lens, it might change how we understand God's common grace. Let's... And remember, remember Jesus in front of Jerusalem, Sean. Jesus is saying, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I would have gathered you hmm. as a chick does her hen, a hen does her chicks. I would have comforted you. But in the most damning words of the New Testament, you would not. You would not. I'm w always willing to embrace and help, but you would not. And so I think we have to live with this partnership, and sometimes we're not very good partners. Hmm. I see some great questions coming up, and somebody said, I will bring this question back for Tim during the Q&A. So let's do one more, if we have time, maybe two examples sure. of common grace, just to make sure this is tracking, and then go to some of the questions. So let's talk about communication. You got your PhD in communications. I did my undergrad in communication from writing, speaking, blogging. I'm a communicator. And one of my favorite, I'm going to read some lines here. One of my favorite part of your books that I just, I, I thumbnailed on page 92 is what you call a universal appreciation of words. So you say, you give a citation from Hinduism where a Hindu writer says, words can comfort or hurt. It is our pride that makes us use words that hurt. And then uh, within Islam, there's a citation from the 33rd surah of the Quran uh, where followers of Allah should only seek to, quote, speak righteous words. Give examples from Buddhism, from a Native American educator, from an atheist, Sam Harris, and oh. of course, Jesus and others in the scriptures talk about the power of words. So how do the power of words point towards common grace? And on top of that, why would it uniquely point towards Christianity if all these other religions also recognize the power of words? Well, let me take the last one first. I don't think it uniquely, exclusively points to Christianity. Okay. We're having, we're having the God okay. conversation at this point. I'm just trying to establish there's a, a, the father of good gifts, a higher power giving us good gifts. Um, so we're kind of back to the ancient inventions illustration because um, one of my favorite proverbs is life and death is in the power of the tongue. Okay, but listen to what the Buddha says. The Buddha says words have the power to both destroy and heal. When words are both true and kind, they can change the world. Boy, that first part, words have the power to both destroy and heal. If he was writing a paper for me, Sean, I might run this for plagiarism. <laughs> I might say, wow, that sounds a lot like these Jewish ancient writers from the book of Proverbs. But it is virtually agreed upon that the Buddha would not have access to the book of Proverbs. So again, we're back to God is in, in a world he knows words are going to hurt people, right? Verbal abuse, demeaning people, racist comments. He knows this is going to happen. So he floods the human race with an idea of two things. One, virtuous communication that can heal, but also the power that communication can do to hurt people. Hmm. Um, so he floods the human race with this idea, and you, all religions are picking up on it. Even Sam Harris is saying, what was his quote? Um, we are all, in order to solve our problems, we have to have conversations. Mm. It's either conversations or violence. And I would say amen to Sam Harris. So again, all I'm doing is saying, how do you account for the Buddha having a, a, a paraphrase of ancient Jewish writers? Again, I'm saying before they ever converse with each other, God has flooded the human psyche with an idea of what virtuous 
good communication should be and then what negative communication giving you a peek of how it devastates people and devastates their soul, their psyche. And God's given us a warning. Do not use words to hurt. Use it to heal. So you're not technically saying God speaks through these Hindu writers or Buddhist writers or Sam Harris on this. You're saying they are recognizing a deeper truth in the way God has made the world and constructed us to be. And his common grace is recognizing this. Hence, common is across space and time and religion. Did I capture well, that? But, yeah, but let me clarify one thing. Okay. Um, I do think he's speaking through these writers. Okay. Again, what does C.S. Lewis say? All truth is God's truth. All of it. Remember, uh, you know, Greg Tinelsoff, one of our mm -hmm. gifted philosophy yeah. faculty, he wrote a great book called Confucius for Christians, where he, he studied Confucianism. And he said, you know, there's there's really parts of Con what Confucius taught that lines up perfectly with the heart of the New Testament. Now, <clears throat> obviously, Sean, when you read Confucius, you have to do so discerning. Right. You, you have to say, OK, this is where it lines up with Scripture. This is where it deviates. Sure. But. That book, Confucius for Christians, is awesome. Mm. And so I, I do think God can speak through uh, individuals, right? And we, of course, have to be discerning to pick up on. John Wesley once said, it is a very great error to believe that you can only be taught by Christians. By the way, in the book, I, I mentioned Wayne Grudem. His systematic theology book is one of the most used books around today. And he his chapter on common grace is phenomenal. I quote mm. him in the book. And he says, it is entirely possible that non-Christians get more of common grace than Christians. In other words, a Christian That's artist uh, won't necessarily be as skilled as a non-Christian artist. A, a, a non-Christian doctor could be more insightful into the workings of medicine, a non-Christian EMS worker could be braver than a Christian EMS worker. So I love the fact that Grudem says this common grace could non-Christians could even take more advantage of it than theoretically Christians could. Okay. I'm tempted to go to Q&A, but let me just ask you one more, and then we should have 12, 15 minutes roughly oh, I love it. to, to love tackle, it. tackle questions. I see some really good ones here from believers yeah. and skeptics, etc. You had a chapter on war. I expected communication because I know you. I expected science. Art didn't surprise me. When we got to war, I was like, how does violence and war suggest common grace? It seems like if God was good, he would want to get rid of it. So what's your point in that chapter? Well, absolutely, God wants to get rid of war. He absolutely wants to do it, but he has to have human partners to do it. Right? Hmm. He's not going to force us to stop. Right? I mean, again, this is C.S. Lewis. God could stop evil by midnight tonight, Sean. Mm -hmm. Anytime somebody goes to do evil, he hits them with a zap that is strong enough to stop them dead in their tracks. So guess what? At 1202, nobody's doing murder. Nobody's abusing kids. There's no rape. But guess what? The only reason people are not doing sin is they don't want the zap. Mm -hmm. God does not want that kind of world. He wants us, as J.B. Phillips, the theologian, said, to willingly choose good over evil. So when it comes to war, yeah, absolutely. God wants to get rid of war, um, but he needs partners. And if there's anything true about war, Sean, we are war making people. I mentioned some uh, historians in the beginning of that chapter that said, you might as well just embrace the fact that humanity and war go side by side. I, I mean, it's almost kissing cousins. As soon as we made um, gardening tools, we use them as weapons. They're yeah, almost, we almost synonymous. So God knows this. So he's going to flood the world with ideas and inventions. One okay. idea is just war theory okay. that, that um, um, theologians like Aquinas, Augustine, articulated what, what does a just war look like? Like if you're going to wage war, what are the parameters that make it a just war? You, you don't attack um, civilians. Right. right. I mean, it's actually a well-documented concept. But what about the Geneva Conventions? The Geneva Conventions were created to put a limit on what nations would do when they wage war. It came from a man named DuPont, who was a salesman, and he shows up, and there's a battle that has just happened, and he's literally walking through uh, wounded and dying people. And he's, uh, Sean, he's horrified at what he's mm. seen. 
So he goes back and says, there's got to be a way of mitigating what I saw. And he created two things. One, the Red Cross, who's one of the founders of the Red Cross. And then he's the one who kicked around the idea of these Geneva Conventions that eventually were created to put limits. Then I say God's given us self-defense, virtuous self-defense. I have a black belt in Kung Fu, very virtuous system. You are never the aggressor. You never use Kung Fu to hurt people just because you want their money or sexual assault. You're the one who protects people. And then I, I address hard issues. Man, it's okay. pretty hard to read the Bible, the Old Testament particularly, and not say, so you're saying God's against war? That, that's craziness. I read the Old Testament. I see a God who wages war a ton. And, and, and that's a fair, again, that's a fair objection. Yeah. And here's John McDowell's cell number. <laughs> that is my go-to <laughs> apologetic strategy. Don't Tim. make me get it out, Sean. Don't oh, make man. Me, don't make me yeah. get it out. All right, man. Hey, I love it, buddy. There's one of God's common grace to me is I have viewers who ask seriously good questions, and there's That's some great. that are already coming in. If you have a question for Dr. Tim Muehlhoff, again, we're talking about his book, Eyes to See. Uh, write question in caps. Throw it in there, and we'll do our best to get to as many as we can. Let's start with one from Tim Talk and see what you think. He says, does this common grace also hold responsible those who have not heard the gospel directly? In other words, are they judged according to their response to this common grace? So, Sean, now we're to the book, The God Conversation with J.P. Moreland. Okay. We're, we're, we, that is a great question. And as Christian communicators, we just can't ignore great questions like that. If we're saying Jesus is the only way to get to God, then it is a totally fair question to say, what of those who have never heard? I absolutely believe. So I'm, not, I, I'm an Arminian. So I believe in something called provenient grace, which means this common grace that God gives, it, it also applies to salvation. It, 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 it lures people towards salvation. It doesn't force them. Okay. So I would say a person who is born in part of the world and will never hear the gospel or think of all the people who have lived um, before the Christ, Christian faith mobilized and became missionary oriented, those okay. people are judged differently. They are judged by how they deal with the common grace that they have that's being presented to them. So they okay. feel... Man, there's something out there. I, I don't know what it is. I cannot articulate it. But there's something out there that is drawing me to, mm. to this entity, this, this being. And I think that's how they'll be judged, if that's all they get. Okay. Uh, we know that God uses dreams. One thing that Rabbi Zacharias wrote about a bunch is that God uses dreams in the Muslim community to, to, to give them an idea of what Jesus is according to the scriptures, not according to Islamic theology. I think all of that is common grace. So my answer to your listener's question is, does God grade on a curve? Absolutely. He, I think he grades on a curve. Now, listen, in the end, it's going to have to do with uh, Jesus. If you get gain entrance into heaven, it is via Jesus. Gotcha. But people may never, and if you don't hear of Jesus, I think they're under the Old Testament dispensation. Okay. I think I think he's treating them as he would an Old Testament person. Okay. And that's kind of so. JP and I didn't hide from this question, and we okay. absolutely acknowledge Sean that really good Christian theologians, apologists disagree on this because, to be honest, the Bible doesn't specifically tackle this question. It always right. presumes a person's heard the gospel. Okay, good. So for our viewers, what you're saying is these examples of common grace can be seen through a lens that suggests God. Then that raises additional uh, questions like what about those who haven't heard about yeah. God, yeah. which yeah. you've covered in a different book? Good. That's that's really helpful. Now, here's what I'm not certain what he means by this, but I'll let we'll, we'll see what you think. Theophilus okay. asks a really interesting question. He says, what about common curses? So instead of common grace, how do we make sense of common curses? So, com uh, so if, uh, if I understand your question correctly, 
uh, common curses would also be common grace. In other words, hmm. if, if um, uh, let's take pornography, okay? So we, we, uh, I work with the Center for Marriage and Relationships here at Biola University. We know that in addiction to pornography, there's precursors to that. Uh, we're too quick to call something an addiction, but there are precursors to that. So if okay. a person is messing with pornography, right, and warping their view of sex, then there's hmm. cause and effect, right? Paul says it this way, you reap what you sow. So God doesn't hmm. hide the consequences of our actions, right? You, you speak abusively to your spouse, your wife, you're going to hurt her psychologically. I, I, I teach self-defense at domestic violence shelters here in Orange County. Yeah. Well, men need to know your language can so damage a person that psychologically they're, they're just the shell of who they are. So God doesn't mm. hide us from the negative effects of our actions. You leave your helmet at okay. home, the, the, the coach is going to uh, have you do wind sprints. And if I mm. keep rescuing my child, he'll never learn you need to pack your own bag and be responsible for that. Mm. Okay. I think that's a common grace, actually, in some ways. I, I did not expect to say that. That's a very interesting way to think about it. Um, so here's one from Hanova says, is God or Satan responsible for the accidental discovery of poisons or other toxic substances? And how do you test the difference without assuming the answer itself? So I love that you brought Satan into this equation because that to be thoroughly Christian, you have to acknowledge the presence of Satan. Mm -hmm. Um, which again, we address in the God conversation. And Sean, I also wrote a book called Defending Your Marriage, The Reality of Spiritual Battle. Yeah, it's where, great. Where I, where I address these issues of where did Satan come from um, and things like that. But, but this is a great observation from a Christian perspective. No doubt Satan is warping God's good gifts. He, he's, mm. Let's go back to dynamite, right? This is uh, Nobel. Who in so Nobel creates dynamite, and one day I don't know if you know the story, Sean, but one day his brother dies, and they mistakenly think it's Alfred Nobel who died. So oh, so they write his obituary. So he reads his obituary, and it says Alfred Nobel, the merchant of death, died today because he's the creator of dynamite. Right. Mm. And he created it for agricultural purposes. Well, he got a chance to read his obituary. Now he knows how he's going to be remembered. He was horrified. So he creates the Nobel Peace Prize to counteract that. So, again, this is Satan or just bad people taking dynamite and using it for bad reasons. And it's God's common grace saying, hey, Alfred, you mm. just got a peek at your obituary. Let's do something about that. And he creates the Nobel Peace Prize that recognizes actions of peace, including uh, medical discoveries, the arts. It celebrates all of that hmm. to say, hey, let's let's look at peace building, human flourishing rather than destruction. It, it is interesting. You cited this earlier that something like dynamite within itself is neither morally good or morally right. bad. You could argue that for a gun, it could be used to murder. It could be used for self-defense. So a poison is a substance. It's not necessarily good or bad. Like something like mercury could be a poison, but it can also be used in certain scientific discoveries and mechanisms for good. So that's a really important distinction to bring in. Here's another question. Theophilus is asking some great ones. So I'm going to bring this back again. If you have questions on evil and suffering, God's common grace, I'll bring them for my guest, Dr. Tim Muehlhoff. But uh, here's one that I that I love from him. I think it's really thoughtful. He says, why does God take all the credit but never the blame? Mm. He gets credited for penicillin, yet didn't he create the harmful microbes in the first place, et cetera? Love that. Love that distinction. So I'm going to argue a distinctly Christian perspective. Paul makes a really interesting comment in his letter to the Church of Rome. He said the earth groans for release. Okay. So I believe what happened when Adam and Eve sinned, 
their sin, because they were to be caretakers of the world, God, it didn't just affect the human race. It actually affected nature. So okay. I, I would argue okay. these microbes are, are not God's creation, but they are a result of a fallen world. And God greatly desires a world that there would be no harmful microbes. But, but that's just um, the kind of world we live in, that we have to take the good and the bad. So in, in, in heaven, will there be hurricanes? Will there be tornadoes? We, we've seen the devastating effect of tornadoes very recently. No, I, no, that, that's a part of a fallen world. Um, and, and, and let me even argue this, and this might be controversial. Even in a weird way, a, a tornado is a signal to the human race. This isn't right. You live in the Hunger Games mm. right now. This isn't what it's supposed to be. I do not want you to live in a world of, of tornadoes. But then by common grace, he gives us now advanced tornado warning systems that now mm. we do get uh, advanced warning that a tornado is coming and we can take safety. But Sean, I think those microbes uh, and Theophilus, this, from my Christian understanding, God grieves these harmful microbes. He didn't create them and actually tries to give us um, a way to mitigate the effects of hurricanes, mm -hmm. microbes, and those kind of things. As, as you may know, in our apologetics program, I teach a number of classes, and one of them is on why God allows evil. Mm -hmm. And I have a whole section on natural suffering, natural evil. And just it was yesterday, the day before, I was reading an article about viruses and how mm -hmm. actually we need viruses, for example, to limit the amount of bacteria in the population. If we didn't have mm -hmm. viruses, bacteria, which I believe there's a greater number of bacteria in our body than cells, they would mutate in such a radical quick fashion that life itself would not be possible. Yeah. So viruses and bacteria uh, are necessary for our environment to flourish. But mm -hmm. one way of looking at the harm that they cause is brought on by the fall, a uniquely Christian doctrine. So in case someone's like, oh, you're making this up as you go along, we're actually pulling from classic Christian doctrines to try to make sense of things such as viruses and bacteria. Uh, go ahead. And can, I, can I say one thing to Theophilus? Yeah. I, I just sincerely want to say, so when we get word of a tornado just devastating a community or, or floods that ravish, you need to know I, I struggle. I don't just look at that and say, okay, Augustine's free will defense. I'm good. No, mm. I, I wrestle. I, I work at domestic violence shelters. Mm. Women who have been beaten by people who are supposed to protect them, who are supposed to love them. So, Sean, I just want to say, like C.S. Lewis, there are times I, I shake my head and say, God, I, I just don't know. Mm. And, and, and this is where ultimately it points to the cross. This is where I love what John Stott said. Stott said, he's one of our theologians. He said, I, I could not believe in God without the cross. Huh. To think that God was immune to our pain and suffering is too much. And, and I would say to Theophilus, if it weren't for the fact that Jesus is a human being, came to <clears throat> earth and knows exactly what it's like to be abandoned, knows exactly what it's like to be beaten, knows exactly what it's like to be judged uh, and even abandoned by God in a weird moment. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So I love the fact that Jesus sympathizes with us. Um, so for me, the answer is going to be Jesus. And I get how that can sound like a cop-out. <laughs> but for, for sure. me, Jesus knows what it's like to look at the <clears throat> death of a friend and weep hmm. at the death of a friend. To me, that brings me great comfort that he knows what it's like to feel the human condition. Well, let me ask you one more question, but I just want to cite at the very beginning, one of the things you said is the hiddenness of God and evil and suffering is a question every worldview has to address not just Christianity. So when I teach this class, I tell my students, I say, if you think in this class, I'm going to tell you 
why God doesn't answer every prayer, why every person suffers, you are going to be sorely disappointed. If the question is, which worldview, all things considered, provides the most rational or logical and emotionally satisfying worldview in terms of answering evil, that's why I'm a Christian. Not because I can tie up and wrap the present with a bow, but because it makes the most sense, even though I have disappointments, even though I have emotional doubt, even though things don't make sense in the big picture of things, it does. Well, we're nearing the end. Go ahead. So let me just comment on what you just said. So I, I totally believe what you say, and that's why I'm a follower of Jesus. I do believe the Christian worldview package wise does the best job of explaining the human condition. But I got I got to be honest and call out the Christian community. Like uh, I have students who who say no to Buddhism and they don't know a thing about it. Hmm. They say, "Oh, well, of course it's not Islam," but they don't know a thing about it. So sometimes as Christians, I think we are so quick to dismiss other perspectives and without ever reading a book of another faith tradition. I, my students read the Quran in one of my classes, cover to cover. I had a missiologist tell me, when your students finish, they'll be part of less than 1% of American Christians who ever read a book of another faith tradition. Wow. So, so sometimes I think, Sean, we're being overly harsh and judgmental on, on things that we actually know nothing about. So let's at least study enough that we can articulate what a Buddhist would believe or a Muslim would believe, even if I, I, I reject it, but let's at least give a fair hearing to other people and not just reject things we honestly don't know anything about. To me, that's that's not a, a good intellectual way to approach this issue. We got a ton more questions, and I apologize to those that we could not get to. We will definitely have you back. Uh, one, one last question, and if you don't mind, you get excited like I do and talk with your hands. The mic is rustling a little on, on your chest. Oh, You're getting so excited. I'm um, so sorry. That's No, I love it. I talk with my hands, too. My kids make fun of me doing this. I'm like, I know. I talk with my hands. Uh, you end the book with a story about when you were with crew, formerly Camps Crusade for Christ, for 30 years on a mission trip to Kenya. I'm curious why, after talking about common grace, you end there and what the takeaway is you would want us and your readers to get. So, Sean, I've been haunted by this experience almost my entire adult life. I, mm. I was in Kenya. We're showing the Jesus film. You're aware of this film. Yeah. It's a great adaptation of the Gospel of Luke, I think. I think it's Luke. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so we're showing this in Kenya. Uh, we set up a huge screen. Uh, we have three different reels. We show it. We have a generator because we're in many places that have no electricity. So three teams are being dropped off that day. We're the first team. We get dropped off. We set up our screen. A thousand people come out that night. Wow. I'll never forget. A thousand people. And just as we're about to turn it on, a, a sophomore from another university comes up to me and says, Tim, we don't have the extension cord. We, we don't have the cord to hook up the projector to the generator. We, we, we can't. And this is before cell phones, Sean. So we're just sitting there like, and there's a thousand people ready to go. Wow. So the sophomore is brilliant. I had spoken that morning, Sean, about Ephesians 3.20. Now, to him who's able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond. <laughs> uh, seriously. And she goes, let's pray. Let's pray that we turn this projector on. God doesn't need electricity, right? Hmm. And I'm like, uh, yes. So literally, Sean, we hold hands. We're praying. Well, just as I'm about to say amen, I hear a truck flying down the road because you know what happened is he dropped off the other two groups and had an extra extension cord so oh interesting back, you know, so now he's working his way backwards gets to us and literally rolls down the window throws it to me just as i say amen and i catch the cord plug it in and we show the film i wrestled with that for a year sean thinking wow. i really wish he would have been two minutes later i really wish he would have gotten there two minutes later because would God have turned on that projector? Now, do I believe he has the power to do that? Yes. If I'm going to be honest, do I think it would have worked? Probably no. So I kind of felt cheated a little bit. Like, God, I want, <laughs> I want you to do something in my life yep. that is undeniable. And that would have been it, man. A projector running and we're all looking at the generator and no cord. 
I would have talked about that the rest of my life, Sean. Mm -hmm. But now I'm not haunted by that. Why? Because you better believe an all-terrain vehicle, an extension cord, a generator, and film all would have been seen as miracles, undeniable miracles by generations past by Christians. Now, is there part of me that was disappointed the generator didn't turn on without the cord? Yes, but thank God for a generator, a cord, hmm. a film projector, and that night over 100 people came to faith. Wow. So I Very view that as God's common grace, even though I'll be honest with all your listeners, there's a part of me that was like, oh, but just turn on the projector, <laughs> right? That would have been so cool, but I'm not haunted by that anymore. Mm, interesting. Tim, there's a lot of things I appreciate about you. One thing is you admit your doubts and your questions. You've written a big on, book on suffering and tragedy, but still admit sometimes there's hurt and there's questions and we don't really know a definitive answer even though there's things that strongly suggest the christian answer i like in your book again eyes to see there's quite a few times where you said is this possible mm -hmm. instead of saying this proves god and penicillin and art you're like is it possible that maybe we're just not looking at this right and it could be god's common grace as an apologist, I, I'm always convicted when I read that. I'm like, man, I just sometimes overstate things. And if anything, you almost erred on the side of understating it just to suggest to people a different way of thinking about the world. So again, the book Eyes to See, whether you are a Christian, you want to understand common grace, or a non-believer, and you're just kind of open to being challenged to think about ways in the world you may not see God, I would highly uh, recommend it. Uh, for those of you who are like, I was looking for more explicit evidences for God today. Uh, the person who did the forward for your book, J.P. Moreland, a colleague of ours at Biola, wrote a book called A Simple Guide to Experiencing Miracles. I interviewed him about two or three months ago, and he lays out how you recognize a miracle, examples of what he thinks is miraculous. Interviewed Craig Keener on my channel, who's written a book called Miracles Today. So if you want more explicit ones, those are two of the best today. Go watch that. Judge that for yourself. Make sure you hit subscribe. We've got some other interviews coming up. I have a financial planner, former atheist, who's become a Christian, who's been dubbed the next Warren Buffett, who's agreed to be interviewed recently. Brilliant. Have a professional hockey player coming on, talking about how to defend the faith like a hockey player. Tons of interesting shows you're not going to want to miss. And Tim actually teaches with me uh, one class a year every couple of years in the bioapologetics program. So if you've ever thought about studying apologetics, we want to talk about how to communicate this. Hopefully, Tim and I came across graciously, thoughtfully today, but also how to defend the Christian worldview. We have a fully online program, information below. If you have an undergrad degree and are a Christian, we'd love to have you join us. Thanks again, and we'll see you all soon. Oh, and by the way, uh, Friday, I'm going back to doing a live Q&A at 12 noon. So bring your questions for me. If you didn't answer them here, uh, join me at noon Pacific Standard Time. We'll see you then. God bless everybody. Hang on, Tim. Don't disappear.